So what's the simplest way to identify when a bar touches the EMA 200? Um, actually, I already have some moving averages already on my chart here. So just for the sake of keeping my chart free of additional indicators here, let's do bar touching the EMA 30 instead. All right. So I already have an EMA 30 on my chart. So I'll just make this a little bolder. There we go. Okay. All right, so let's grab a comparison solver on the default time frame. There we go. Okay, so before we get started here, you know, let's let's look at the chart and you know look at this logically and say, okay, so what's what's the uh, grab an arrow, right? What's the difference between this bar, which obviously is not touching our EMA thirty, you know, versus this bar, you know, or this bar or this bar, right? What do all all three of these bars have in common, right? What what do these three bars have in common? It's pretty simple. The low is below the EMA, right? So all three of these bars, the low is below it and the high is above it. Pretty simple, straightforward, right? So that's what we're gonna look for is the low being below it and the high being above the moving average. So um, input A, that's going to be our bar prices. So let's produce a long output when the high price is above um, the, EM, the EMA. And we'll produce a short output when the low price, um, not there we go, when the low price is below the EMA. And input B, that will be our EMA. All right, there's our EMA, and let's put in a 30 period. There we go, there. Now, uh, if you look at Bloodhound's output, we can see that Bars that touch the moving average have a long and a short together, right? If there's a long only, well, then the bar is above the moving average. And if it's a short only, here we go. So here's some shorts only, and the bar is below our moving average, right? So we want to filter out the long and short uh, outputs together, right? So uh, we'll grab a long short modifier to do that filtering for us. There. And we can put this, uh, the mode, uh, let's see, you know, there's a couple of modes we can use, but I typically use the product mode um, for that. There. Call it product there. And right, and so now it strips out the long only and short only outputs and leaves us with the long and short together. And so that's all the bars touching our EMA. All right, so that's just a simple touch. You know, now if you have, you know, other requirements of that touch, you know, then you might have other comparison solvers getting involved here as well. You know, but a simple touch is just one comparison and the long short modifier there. And let's see, Vito says he was using the crossover. Um, yeah, you know, probably the crossover, well, the crossover only identifies the first bar that's touching, but also, a crossover could give you a false signal because the bar could just gap over 
your moving average. I mean, that's probably pretty rare that a bar would ever gap over it, but it is technically possible that if you use a crossover, you could get a, a bar that gaps over and you would get, you know, a false positive signal, you know, on a touch. So yeah, so the crossover will work most of the time, but uh, but it's not going to tell you all the bars that are touching. You know, sometimes you get three bars in a row touching, and the crossover is only going to give you the first bar touch. You know, which maybe that's what you want. You know, you know. So if you only want to know, if you only want to see the first bar that that touches, you know, I guess a crossover, you know, would work fine. Um, for the vast majority of the time. So, but, but uh, to be 100% accurate, you would want this, you know, uh, plus a signal blocker, you know, if, if you only wanted to see the first bar that touches, yeah, you'd want that plus a signal bar blocker, you know, to be 100% accurate. Uh, confident you know in those signals um, so and that would that would eliminate bars gapping over uh, it would eliminate those false signals so uh, oh okay yeah so Vito or sorry Leo is only only wants to know when the wicks are touching so no you can't do that in one solver no because you have to filter out the body uh, of the bar of touching you know so that's going to require comparing the other bar prices you know to the moving average as well so that's a whole bunch of you know wicks you know create a lot of variability you know because if it's an up bar versus a down bar right you have different body prices so yeah that creates a lot of variability so, okay, so now I know what you mean by a, a pin bar. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't quite know what a pin bar was. Okay, that makes sense, a pin bar. So, all right, so if we want the wicks only, all right, let's go ahead and expand upon this. And make it a, a two-for-one deal here. All right, so let's do some pin bars. Yeah, now that we have these other uh, custom prices, you know, available to Bloodhound only. Um, yeah, this will make it a lot. Yeah, we can reduce the number of solvers now. So, right, so uh, a few updates back, we added the body top, body bottom, and body uh, uh, median uh, prices here, right? So these are custom bar prices, right? So that will actually, yeah, simplify the comparison solver logic in finding pin bars here. So, all right, let's see here. Um, so we need this solver and a couple of others to do some filtering. So I'm going to add this solver down here again. So we'll keep this up here. So we need to um, at least first identify is the bar touching, and then we can apply filtering to see if it's just the wick touching. Right. So I will need to um, create this logic twice. All right, so we just have a duplication of the the raw bar touching um, logic there, and so now we need to add the filtering to make sure that the body is not touching. Yeah, there's a couple of ways that we can do this. I think I might have a, a way that we can do this with just one additional comparison solver instead instead of two. 
So let's see here. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to go to my solvers tab and I'm going to make a copy of the bar touching. And this time we're going to identify if the body is touching. So, uh, oops, you know what? I, I, uh, accidentally left my bar touching solver. I had left it on the wrong price there. So just fixing that real quick. Okay. So now the body touching solver. Yeah. So, um, I want, for a long, I want to use the body top and for a short, I want to use the body bottom. All right. So you can see how using the body top, versus the body bottom, right, is similar to the bar touching where we're using the high price or the low price, right? So this will tell me if the body is touching um, a moving average, right? So let's put that on the logic board here. So we'll go to existing nodes, default time frame, and there's the body touching the EMA. Put that down here, connect that in, right? And as we can see, that's going to look, you know, exactly the same, right, as our bar touching solver. So, uh, and once again, we want to filter out when we get long and short output together. So that body is touching and that body is touching. Yeah, so on both of these bars, right, the body is just barely touching um, the moving average. So, so again, we're just going to need another long short modifier function node there. Connect that in. And once again, we want the product mode. Let's put that on product and I'll put the name in there. So yeah, there we go. So, uh, right. So on this, this doji bar here, right, there is no body. So obviously, you know, it's just the Wix touching. Um, and so this, this bar touching, you know, isn't identified because there's no body to it, but these two bodies, these two bars here with bodies that are touching our moving average are identified there. So what we want is the opposite of this. So we have to reverse everything. Um, and let's see here. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we're just going to, we're going to need a inverter node. Yeah, I don't think there's a way to to do it with just the solver. Yeah, I think we're going to have to use an inverter node there. So with the inverter, we can see that, you know, bars that are that are touching or at least bars without the body touching the moving average, right? We're we're getting a long and a short output there. So yeah, so this, this bar touches, this bar touches. Um, there we go. This bar here, the wick touches, right? So that part's working. And so now we just need to grab a and node. Oh, not an additive, sorry. Grab a and node, connect that in. Yeah. Uh, right. So there we go. So this is this is all the bars touching the EMA thirty, and then we can add our body filter to it, and now we only get the wicks touching. 
Yeah, there we go. So there's a bunch of bars where just the wicks are touching. Yeah, and if the body touches, it's filtered out. So, okay, there we go. So there's our two common ways of identifying if the body touches or um, if it's a, a pin bar. Yeah, so Leo provided a image of a pin bar. Yeah, so Leo, you're going to need a whole nother set of logic identifying pin bars. Yeah, so this actually isn't pin bars. Um, sorry. Let's rename this here. This is just, you know, Wix. Pull this up here so everybody else can see. There we go. So that's a, a I guess, a, yeah, a classic pin bar. Um, there's some other images down here. Yeah, where a pin bar is a little more liberal there, you know, with some percentage definitions. So, you know, Bloodhound doesn't do percentages. So you're going to need, yeah, you know, depending on how sophisticated you want to get with identifying these pin bars, you might have to have a dedicated indicator to do that. So, um, you know, I don't know. Maybe Ninja Trader's candlestick indicator might identify pin bars. I don't, you know, I don't know. Besides the touching logic, yeah, you'll need a whole nother set. It depends on, as I said before, how sophisticated you're going to get with how you define a pin bar. So you do have to predefine what, a, you know, the definition of a pin bar. And, uh, you know, and is, if your definitions are simple, then you could perceivably identify pin bars within Bloodhound. Um, but if your definition gets too complex or too flexible, then, you know, Bloodhound's not going to do that, you know, because again, guys, Bloodhound is not a pattern recognition piece of software. So Bloodhound can do simple stuff, but not something as complex as a pin bar. You know, really the, the variability of a, you know, of what I would consider a pin bar is, you know, the, this definition is very flexible, very variable. And so you would need a dedicated indicator to do it properly. All right. Well, so it looks like Leo got his answer as best as we could do today with the information that we have here. So, um, so again, just to, to summarize there, you know, this is your wick touching logic, you know, and then you're going to need uh, additional, an uh, additional, you know, if you have an indicator that identifies, you know, pin bars, you know, then you would just need one more solver, you know, that, that uses your indicator to identify what's a pin bar otherwise, right? So that would just be one more solver if you have an indicator. But if you don't have an indicator and you're trying to do this within Bloodhound, then, you know, you're going to have a whole nother, you know, set of logic here that is trying to filtering for pin bars. And then you would just connect that into your AND node here.